Well, the prestige of the classic media was predicated on their influence. And so let's say that the New York Times is an, in, an influential and prestigious outlet. Okay, why? Well, here's an example. You write a book, it hits the New York Times bestseller list. Well, who cares? Well, the reason you care is because if you hit the list, your book sales exponentially increase. And so the prestige is related to the power of the, of the institution to change perception and behavior. Well, so it's, it's, it's the brand, you could say. So the brand is the marker of that prestige that's been stored up across time. Yeah, but the thing is that the, the, the older media forms are raping their brands. Right? They have value because they were prestigious, because they did change people's opinions and behavior, but that's evaporating. And it's partly evaporating because, well, there are new media forms, and it's partly evaporating because people no longer really trust them to give them that unbiased simplification. And so, and, are the, and the thing about the egalitarianism of YouTube is that it's got its pros and its cons. And then this is the same with the web in general, is that the signal to noise ratio, there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of noise. And that's what happens under extraordinarily egalitarian circumstances, is there might be a lot of signal, but it's damn hard to find it. Because you don't have qualified gatekeepers. Now that's changing, because even though YouTube is egalitarian, there's a vicious hierarchy that's already developed. Like, Almost everyone on YouTube has no subscribers, right? You know, a thousand, a hundred, something like that. A tiny proportion has a hundred thousand. An even tinier fraction has half a million, and then above a million it's like vanishingly small. So the hierarchy emerges, and I would say it's a hierarchy of competence almost by definition. Let's say, we don't know what YouTube does, but whatever it does, the people who have four million subscribers are doing best. So it's a hierarchy of competence right away. Well, like everything to some degree is a social construct. Like uh, the, 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 the problem with those sorts of phrases is that they're used as one phenomena causes for everything. That's how you can tell if you're talking to someone who's an ideologue. It's like, well, why is that happening? Well, it's the patriarchy. It's like, oh, I see, it's happening because of society. Well, yeah, of course. You know, you could even say that you die because of the inadequacy of the patriarchy. You know, if it just got its act together, it could figure out how to make you immortal. Well, fair enough. You know, that's true, although it's not true in any useful sense. It's like, is, is, is it a social construct? You gotta be way more specific than that before, your com before a comment like that has any utility whatsoever. You've got to delve into the details, you know, and you also have to define what you mean. To some degree, because we're social animals, there, there isn't anything that we do that social, that society has no influence on. So, but that doesn't mean that everything is a social construct. That's just, it's muddy, muddy thinking. I don't think it will. I think it's done. You know, Marshall McLuhan, and his famous, the me I don't remember what he said exactly, the medium is the message, there we go, that's it. What did he mean by that? New technological forms require new forms of perception and behavior. And I used the MSNBC example earlier to show that they don't know the idiom, right? They think, well, YouTube, <laughs> low production values, you know, cute cat videos. We, there's no idiom. It's like there is an idiom, there's conventions. They don't know them. They can't make the translation. They don't know how. And so I don't think they're gonna survive. I don't see any evidence that they are because I don't see any evidence that people under 30 care anything about or even know to some degree about the old school media organizations. That's not where they live. Now, I don't know if where they live is any better. It's different though, that's for sure. And it's not obvious. Like, I don't think very many horse and buggy makers turned into auto ma manufacturers. You know, I mean, I assume some did, 
but my guess is the vast majority of them couldn't make the adjustment because they thought of the car as a horseless carriage. Well, that's not what it was. We don't even know what it was, but it wasn't a horseless carriage, that's for sure. So, and YouTube isn't TV by a different form. First of all, it's permanent. That's weird. And, and unbelievably powerful, because it also means that for the first time in human history, the spoken word or the, or the received image has as much permanence as a book. But it's way faster to market. Way more people attend to it. Like, you know, I can put up a YouTube video that I make in a day and it'll have 150,000 views in a week. I can't do that with a book. That would take me three years and probably it wouldn't happen. I probably wouldn't sell 150,000 copies. So, it's a whole new thing. And it's, God only knows how powerful it is. You know, we have no idea. It's a Gutenberg revolution for the spoken word. It's a different thing, that's right, it's a different landscape. The, old, the, the rules that work for television don't work for YouTube, because YouTube isn't television. Now, I, that doesn't mean I know what it is, but, but it likes things rougher. That's, you, know, you can observe it to some degree. It doesn't like editing very much. It wants to see the mistakes. It wants to see the warts. It trusts it then. It doesn't want everything airbrushed and edited out. Um, it doesn't care as much about attractiveness. You know, like, it isn't like all the YouTube people who have become influential are the good-looking news anchors that you see on CNN. In fact, I think that's also something that people have come to distrust. So, but you just can't make the lateral move from a, an old media to a new media, especially if you have contempt for the new media, which is a big mistake. It means you don't know anything about it. So you're shunted off into irrelevancy before you realize it. And so, you know, maybe the same thing will happen to YouTube too in five years, because a new technology will come out, that could easily happen. So. I would say no. I don't think so, but I think that's, I think maybe that would be the case if they knew the context, you know. But I think, I think it's very easy, and some, it's been something I've been absolutely horrified about for the entire last year. It's like, it's certainly possible that I've said something in the 260 videos that are online, most of my previous courses, that if taken out of context would sink me, right? That hasn't happened. Thank God for that. You know, it means I've either been very fortunate or I've been very careful about what I've been saying. And I would say both of those are true. It's certainly possible that I'll say something tomorrow and be done. That's the most likely, I've felt that way the whole year. The most likely outcome for me was that I would say something that would sink me. And all the context in the world wouldn't matter. So I think it's I'm more protected than that now, I would say, because I've been attacked a lot and, you know, it's the crying wolf phenomena. If you attack, if you hear a hundred attacks on someone and they all turn out to not be true, you're probably less likely to believe the hundred and first. But, like, I have this talk coming up on November 11th, which I'm actually very worried about because I know that the protesters who will be there in force have been emboldened by the fact that they got the same talk cancelled by Ryerson University about three months ago. And I'm quite nervous about the possibility that someone who's hypothetically, um, what would you say, I hate to say, who's hy who hypothetically holds views that are similar to the panelists, even though the panelists are very diverse, will do something fatally stupid, and it'll be captured. Or, or even not so stupid, and will be edited to look bad, and you know, that that'll, that'll be a catastrophe. Or that there will be agents provocateur placed in the audience to do exactly that. So, the, the price of a social media mistake is infinite. Maybe, maybe it would be appropriate for us to think about the media access that individuals have now as an amplifier. 
you know, rather than something that's necessarily negative or necessarily positive. This has happened a lot to me in the, in the last year, where something that could have been negative wasn't, in fact, it turned out to be very positive. And I do think I'm in a position now so that I have more leeway for error. But, but I, don't have, I still don't have a lot of faith in that. You know, because I can come out, I can make a video and say, look, like, as far as I can tell, this is what happened. I take responsibility wherever that was necessary. And now I might, that might be okay. Depend on the magnitude of the, of the error, right? So, but, so fair enough. Well, and, and the reason, and the reason I bring that up is, again, I don't like to argue, is just in terms of one of the things I like to think about is, like a hit piece doesn't win, right? Public shaming doesn't really work like it used to because the media doesn't control when your message gets out. So if the media y doesn't Yes, okay, so, well, you certainly have more defense now. You know, so if, that, that's exactly right. So if, if something is, is published about me, um, I can make a video saying, well, n no, this is what I think. And, and that is powerful. And, and, but the, that works for people who have some influence in YouTube. Like, if you're a, someone whose channel has very few viewers and, and someone takes out a hit piece on you, then you can't defend yourself very well. But certainly, someone who's well positioned on YouTube, like, it's not obvious to me, this is a weird thing, like, it's not obvious to me that I have less influence than the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, for example, which is pretty damn weird, you know, and it's like, I say that with, it might not be true, that might not be true, but we don't know how to measure these things, so if I get attacked by a major news outlet, it isn't clear that they will have more readers than I will have viewers, so, so the, the easy access to YouTube does give you some defense, but that's also predicated on having a following of some significance, so that you have some impact when you speak. So, I guess it's a consequence of being a media force as an individual. But you can, that, you can certainly have that now. It, it's not easy, but it's certainly possible. And, and I'm thinking, of course, of uh, PewDiePie, or PewDiePie was his name, where the Wall Street Journal claimed that he's a Nazi because he'd made some humorous videos and done some satire. And all I saw when I watched that, and this is what, I don't know if you, you ever watched Scott Adams or Tara Strokes or some of those, the two movie guys. I think one people, one set of people watching the movie where they go, wow, the Wall Street Journal really hit PewDiePie hard and made him look like a Nazi. And I think a bunch of people, most people, especially people in their 30s, the movie they saw was, wow, the Wall Street Journal lied about this guy that we know is a good guy. So Wall Street Journal is garbage now. We'll never trust them again. Right, 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 right. Yeah, well, you can see that, that power shift occurring, definitely. And, I mean, I, I haven't seen any good studies of this. Like, I don't know, you know, if you took your typical 25-year-old, say, American 25-year-old, what proportion of their information they're garnering from, let's say, the, the YouTube heavy hitters, and what proportion they're garnering from classical sources. My suspicion is it's more the former than the latter, and certainly the case for a very large number of people, even though it might not be true for the average person yet. I don't know. And it's so new. Like, I would say YouTube's only become a significant cultural force, what, over the last three years? It's something like that. It's like, it's, it's completely new. So, we don't know what to make of it yet. Yeah, that's sort of kind of a trivial point, but that's on point two, which is, I've gotten caught a lot of like media attention because I was able to bring people from the online world to the offline world. And just feel free to riff off of this point, but I had a big epiphany where I would watch a lot of fitness channels on YouTube, and then I would notice they would have fitness expos, and the lines would be out the door. And these people never got one piece of media coverage. The New York Times never, never talked about them, and then I realized, holy crap, all these people from YouTube, they are showing up to your stuff. They are, they are yeah. your books. They are going to your films. What the hell is this? And then I kind of applied that to journalism or politics or whatever. Well, I was just on a Jocko Willink's podcast, and Jocko has published a book recently, and it, it's had no real media coverage, but it hit the New York Times bestseller list, and the only reason for that is because he's been talking about it in his podcast. He has a million listeners. 
you know, a day, uh, uh, per podcast. Like that, that's a lot of listeners. I think he does one a week, something like that. So yeah, you can, you, yeah, and I, I got this book coming out in January called 12 Rules for Life, and it's doing very well in pre-sales. And the only reason for that is that I've tweeted about it a bit, not much. I haven't even made a video about it yet, although I talked to Dave Rubin about it yesterday. But we, we don't, and I, I'm, I'm trying to work that out with, it's Penguin Random House that's publishing it, and they have publicists, right? And we're trying to figure out, it's like, okay, how exactly do you market this? Like, and I don't even know, like, is their publicity team any stronger than my publicity team? So it's not obvious at all. And so, well, it's new territory. We're all feeling our way.